Good morning. It is 9.43 a.m. <clears throat> on Sunday, December 31st, 2017, the last day of 2017. Uh, I just got up and this is five more minutes and I'm Christiana Ellis. It's Sunday, so even though it is New Year's Eve, I am going to continue my rewatch of Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. Uh, today I am talking about episode eight... Is that right? I think so. Yes. Uh, the title being The Fortunate Ones Missing Hearts. This is another uh, standalone episode as opposed to the complex episodes which follow the Laughing Man case. But as with many of the other standalone episodes, we're still interested in pursuing character development uh, for our major characters. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny that I say major characters because, of course, the major is the one who gets um, most of that in this episode. She, um, This show and many of the other Ghost in the Shell properties um, have uh, an interesting... Uh, part of the tone is the ambiguity. It doesn't like to ever give us definitive, firm answers about things. Um, however, what we get is a deeper peek at some of what the Major's got going on, and we can speculate about it, but we certainly don't get told any easy answers about what she's actually dealing with. But there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this episode. So, um, the basic plot is very simple. Um, we have the major who, one of her friends, uh, works as a nurse and tells her about a little girl who just got a heart transplant. And the thing is, though, that the heart apparently came from a kid whose family didn't consent for it to be donated. And so something obviously went wrong there. And so the major's friend is worried and, wa and wants the major to look into it because obviously that uh, that stuff is a very fraught subject and uh, even in this world where people can get these prosthetic replacements and so uh the major is you know willing to help but it's only really when aramaki the leader of section nine says well it might be tied to this kidnapping ring we've heard about uh that they uh, launch an official investigation uh, but so in the process of the investigation, they, uh, you know, they, they check out the company that, you know, does various, um, you know, the, there, there's a lot going on. So we, we check out the company that's responsible for some of the prosthetics and the movement um, of, uh, of organs. And also they will grow organs in pigs uh, for people. Um, and it's notable because even though it is a company that makes its money on growing actual biological organs, the president of the company is someone who voluntarily abandoned his biological body and is now inhabiting a very primitive sort of robotic body, um, just because he likes it, apparently. Um, that doesn't really tie into the plot, but we'll talk more about him in a minute. Um, there's also the detective that was originally looking into it for the major's friend who appears to have had some sort of a, a, an accident um, or he's um, had to go to the hospital for unknown reasons. When they check, they, when they go to interview him, they discover some uh, people sneaking out uh, of his hospital room having erased his memories. They chase them. They turn out to be uh, medical students who are trying to make money on the side. They're very privileged, um, rich kids trying to, you know, do their own thing without really considering any of the consequences. But it's also obvious they're very in over their heads. So Section 9 realizes pretty quickly that they're not dealing with a massive kidnapping ring here. They're dealing with a couple of dumb kids. And so they're... They decide to have a little fun, quote, with them um, and do really, like, go a little overkill in terms of catching them. But uh, the major in particular goes a little dark in terms of her decision to teach the one kid a lesson. Because 
Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later. So, but the base, that's the basic plot is that these students were essentially just switching labels on, um, organs, uh, telling themselves that it was, uh, all cool because all it meant is that you know people who couldn't normally afford organs would get them at a cheaper price because they're buying them on the black market and and essentially it's just what they're doing is they're violating the consent of the people that said that you know that didn't consent for the organs to be donated and you know so in the grand scheme of things that's not as terrible it's a little more terrible that they erased the detective's memory to try to cover their tracks but um uh at the same time, what we have around the edges of that plot is a lot of interesting stuff. For one, when we hear about this girl who received the heart transplant at the beginning, she's a little girl. She's got a big, uh, you know, stuffed animal with her in bed. And when the major comes and sees her uh, and is talking to her friend, there's a little bit of uh, interesting nuance where the friend is talking about how great it is that the girl was able to receive this heart transplant because it meant that she didn't have to go to a full replacement prosthetic body and uh, especially you know kind of mentioned sort of tossing off this idea oh well because it would have been so hard to have to go through having a full prosthetic body at that age um, and the major uh, doesn't really say anything, but the friend you see, we see her kind of catch herself because she realizes, of course, that as she is now talking about how hard that would be and how great it is that she didn't have to do go through that, she realizes, as we do, that's what the major had to do. And so it's a little bit of a way to give us an indication that it was probably hard for the major. Oh boy, my camera's little uh, automatic color control settings are a little, going a little haywire here. <laughs> Let's give it a little more light, see if that helps helps it calm down. So uh, the yeah, so the idea that it would have been hard because uh, first of all, we remember the story from an earlier episode where the major uh, you know Motoko talks about holding her doll but not being able to fully control her robotic hands yet and accidentally crushing the doll in her hand. And again, this is something we, we see a shot of in uh, the opening credit sequence, um, kind of out of context there. But um, um, it's also relevant due to the, the last shot, which we'll get into in a moment, but the, the idea of con you know, control of the hands. So this idea of learning to control the body but also because presumably if as a little kid, they would want to give you like a little kid body, but then you'd have to like, you know, switch them out like a hermit crab as you get older because your, your prosthetic body would naturally not normally age like a biological one would. So, you know, you're basically going to be in a position where you're going to be six and you're going to look like you're six until you get a new body. And then you're going to look whatever age that is and then you're going to look that age until you get another one. And so how many stages do you do? It probably depends on how much money you have, right? Um, <laughs> because it's like, uh, so you might have a kid that gets to look like they're, they're eight until they're 14. And then they get to look like they're 16 until they're 23 or something like that, you know? So that's, uh, you can understand that and that on top of the technical difficulties, which we don't necessarily have a good understanding of. But again, crushing the doll is supposed to be an indication. It's a, it's a learning process to control those prosthetic bodies. So we can understand that the major would be emotionally invested in this case, wanting to know what's going on. Um, but, you know, as they, uh, as they start looking into uh, the, the case and they go to this company, there is the character that I mentioned previously, which is the president of this con this company that has placed himself in, and everyone just calls it a Jameson type, but it's this weird little boxy shape with very primitive looking robotic, uh, arms on it. No real face it has the same sort of three eye, uh, uh, you know, visual thing like the Tachikomas have. And it's, but, and it carries a little fan 
and it has this uh, Texan accent, which the major suspects is an, an affectation um, because he's not from Texas. So that's weird. Um, and so it's he is interesting, for, you know, just kind of as a character, but also in the context of the broader issues this case brings up, which is just the idea of the value of biological versus uh, prosthetic because this guy's whole company, which he apparently really believes in as a cash cow, is this idea that you give someone, you give them your genes and they will grow organs for you in a genetically engineered pig. And so if you ever need a replacement organ, there you go. Um, and that's like their business. And he seems like he's, you know, He's first, you know, presses Togusa, who actually has human organs, to say, yeah, you should uh, you should sign up with us. And then even the major, who he realizes is full of prosthetics, says, well, you could still invest. And so he's obviously a believer in this idea that you would replace with biological organs. And yet himself, he abandoned his human body voluntarily. He didn't even need to. And he's not even put himself in a uh, in a humanoid looking body. So obviously there's some interesting duality there in terms of what's better, you know. And uh, so in any event, we discover that this company um, basically, uh, you know, they, they, they investigate them, but it doesn't seem to be where the actual um, crime has taken place. It's just context. In the meantime, it's Togusa who goes to the hospital um, and sees the guys ha coming out from having erased the detective's memory. And we discover that they basically did that just because they realized he was closing in on realizing that it was them that switched the labels and so on. So again, the actual crime, the mystery is not very complicated here. Um, but, uh, we do get a nice moment just of him, uh, him chasing them out through the hospital and then in a very sort of calm way, puts a special bullet in his revolver and shoots a tracker onto their car, which is critical, obviously, in terms of them being able to follow. Um, but then it also has a nice follow-up of the medical students in a panic in the car talking about like, he just fired on us. And it's again, it's just sort of an indication that they don't know what they're doing. They're, these these are not hardened criminals that are going to be a significant challenge for Section Nine here. Um, but we, so you know, we hunt them down. Um, the Tachkoma gets to uh, race across the rooftops, invisible. And that's kind of fun. And then uh, later, um, in an attempt to basically, it's like, okay, let's actually bring them in. Um, the major gives Bato permission to <laughs> use some of the Tachkoma's more impressive gear. But basically the idea of like, let's scare them a little before we bring them in. Don't hurt them, but scare them. And so there's a definite note of, uh, you know, don't hurt the people inside, but shoot up the car. So they, <laughs> the Tachkoma uses its machine guns to shoot out the, uh, the tire. Not just the tire, but like the whole wheel well. <laughs> Riddled with bullet holes. So it crashes and then uh, they have, it's it's a teeny little throwaway deal, uh, detail here, but um, it's neat uh, in the sense that the big cannon that the Tachikomas have on the front normally has a little sort of a bracket on it that prevents it from firing. And we see that in order to remove that cover, it has a physical piece that has to be removed in a location that the Tachikomas are not able to reach themselves. And so it's just an interesting sort of safety feature for an AI controlled uh, robot to, uh, you know, it has its machine guns, but the big cannon, it's not able to fire itself. It needs a human intervention um, to, <laughs> to do that. Now they're smart enough. We could presumably that you could imagine them figuring out how to do that, but it's just an interesting little detail. And then they use that to, you know, create a scary explosion. But then, you know, like when they realize that one of the three has kind of gotten away somewhere, the major decides to chase him down. And this is where it starts to turn a little dark, especially just because we're 
we're still not 100% sure how she feels about it, but we also have already recognized that these kids are just dumb. You know, they're, they're privileged and they broke the law and it's not cool, but they're, they're scared already. But they also had spoken about the idea that they're not going to have to do any jail time for this. They're going to get a slap on the wrist. And so the major decides she wants to teach this extra kid an extra lesson. And so she kind of pretends at first to be with the Yakuza because that's what these kids are assuming um, is that it's the Yakuza hunting them down for encroaching on their turf. Uh, and so the major though gets a little bit dark and scary for us because it, and it's like, even I think as we're laughing while, uh, the Tachikoma blows up their car, um, it's, it's kind of not funny when we see, you know, the major use the Tachikoma in its invisible mode to like crush through this, this, uh, corrugated metal uh, corridor and then having her stalk this kid with a knife out and um, and I, I don't think that we ever really think she's doing anything other than trying to scare him but it's uh, so there's a little bit of a fake out where it seems like she really stabbed him but it's actually just some kind of oil coming out from a pipe um, that she stabs and she because she's just scaring him but again it all just comes down to She's obviously got emotional investment in this case, and it brings up some unpleasant emotions for her. Uh, so they bring in the, the guy, you know, he's not really hurt. He's just, he's, she's successfully scary. Um, there's a nice little joke with the touch coma that she had crammed down the hallway is not able to get out by itself. So she just says, just wait, they'll come get you. Um, but then we also get the, the last scene here. There's a little bit of Togusa and Bato talking about how the major was kind of not acting quite herself during this whole case. And Bato explains to Togusa, you know, essentially what we kind of already put together, which is that, you know, well, this, the little girl and that started this whole thing, um, you know, it's kind of like the major herself, only she ended up going not that way. And, uh, and so we can imagine it being tricky for her. Um, and in the meantime, we see that Bato has apparently ordered a piece of exercise equipment that is, um, you know, apparently designed for extremely strong, probably prosthetic only, uh, muscles, um, to, to test with. And, uh, the major comes in and kind of ribs him about it of just like, you're wasting your money. You have, you have prosthetic muscles. Those don't do anything. You're just like... You're spending a lot of money to just sort of prove to yourself how strong you are, except that the strength is entirely dependent on the prosthetic muscles that you've purchased, you know, that Section 9 has purchased for your, your body. So it's not, what, what are you trying to prove? Um, and uh, he kind of fires back just saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, if you're so macho and scary, why don't you just switch to a male body. You don't need to have a female body. You could uh, be stronger like me and have more authority if you switch to a male chassis. And uh, here's, this is, this is, you know, furthering uh, a little visual motif that's going to run through the rest of the season too, which is the Major's Watch. So we have her basically respond to that challenge with like, oh yeah, well then bring it. But we first see her remove a little thin lady's watch from her left wrist slip it into her pocket before she goes up and she's she squares up like she's maybe going to fight him and he you know he gets into the boxing stance and then she just stares at him and then smiles and he punches himself because of course she is demonstrating that the physical strength doesn't matter if you can hack into their <laughs> brain and, and make them punch themselves and she jokes about the idea that, you know, you're going to, I'm delighted to see in your report how you describe how you successfully used every muscle in your hand. And uh, so that's, it's kind of fun. Um, it also speaks to the major's sort of tactics in this sort of situation, which is, there's a lot of lateral thinking. She is um, 
not one to let herself just be needled exactly, but she's also going to come at you from the side rather than straight ahead. Um, but then we also see in the last shot that I pre mentioned at the beginning, she puts the watch back on. It's a very delicate, thin lady's watch that, first of all, we can imagine wouldn't fit on a bigger wrist. And then we see her kind of working the muscles in her hand, a little bit like she just said, you know, Bato did, but also we remember learning to work her hand and how she had crushed the doll when she was a kid. But she, you know, is able to control her hand well, kind of smiles, and then that's the end of the episode. So there's some interesting uh, probing into the Major's personality there, um, but it's still left largely ambiguous because she is not um, the type to talk about her feelings. Anyway, so uh, that does it for this episode. Next week we'll talk about episode nine, which is uh, another complex episode, and it's called The Man Who Dwells in the Shadows of the Net. Chat, chat, chat. And uh, that's an interesting episode because if I recall correctly, it basically, uh, I'm not sure that it actually features our main characters really at all, because it's mostly just about everyone talking about the Laughing Man cases, resurgence, and figuring out what's going on. But it's pretty good, so I'll be back next week for that. And in the meantime, I'll talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes, uh, the first five more minutes of 2018. Happy New Year!